Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Acts chapter 4. And uh, you know that the lame man by the beautiful gate was just healed in the previous chapter. And uh, Peter uh, when everybody came together in the temple to say, what's going on? Peter preached to them and said, hey, this is the name of Jesus and faith is in, in his name that caused this. So here we go. Chapter four. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So now we have some religious rulers coming around. Whenever there's a crowd, whenever they're listening to somebody else, oh, the religious rulers want to know. What's going on? Who are the people responding to now? And so uh, they came upon them, uh, verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, specifically, the Sadducees were the ones that did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They did not believe, in a sense, in life after death, okay, the resurrection. They did not believe in angels or spirits. And such so the Sadducees were not really the most spiritual or wise uh, of the Jewish re uh, leaders. The Pharisees did believe in the resurrection from the dead, did believe in angels and spirits and such. And so it said these Sadducees came being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in the name uh, in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, verse 4, many of those who heard the word believed, too late. I mean, they arrested Peter and John, but it's too late. They had already preached the word after this miracle. And it says, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So we're talking about this early church that started with 120 in the upper room before the day of Pentecost. And then on the day of Pentecost, Peter got up and preached and about 3,000 were added to them. So we're talking about 3,120-ish or so. But now, by the time we get to chapter 4, and this lame man was healed and Peter preaches in the temple to this crowd, the number of just the men in the Jerusalem church came to be about 5,000 men. And you can imagine, you know, if most of these men are married and if they have children, you know, Jewish people tended to have uh, more children than we have in our society today. So you'd say, man, some of these families, six, seven, eight people, and so very likely 5,000 men could easily be 20,000 people, 30,000 people. We don't really know. But I mean, the Jerusalem church was really growing fast and very, very large already, about 5,000 men. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, talking about Peter and John, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Talking about healed this lame man. Verse eight, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is interesting because this is chapter four now. And it says in Acts chapter 2 that all those 120 were filled with the Spirit. But this says, then Peter filled with the Spirit. Now, some people might think, well, yeah, but he was Spirit-filled because that happened in Acts chapter 2. And so from now on through the end of his life, he's a quote-unquote Spirit-filled believer. I want you to know that's not the way the book of Acts speaks of being Spirit-filled. That once you're filled with the Spirit and maybe speak in spiritual language, that from then on, you're just Spirit-filled. That's not true. The way the book of Acts talks about it, it's as if you can be full today, but not full tomorrow. Uh, 
You can be full this morning, but not be full this afternoon. Well, we need to continually be filling up with the Holy Spirit so that we stay full of the Spirit. And this is why, by the way, in Act, excuse me, in Ephesians 5.18, the Apostle Paul says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And be filled is a verb, and it's in the present tense. And in Greek, the present tense is a continuation. In other words, the aorist tense would be an event. Be filled like an event. But using the present tense, we would maybe be able to translate it like this. Continue to be filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. And so Paul teaches us as believers that, yeah, you don't just get filled one time with the Spirit because, you know, you, you minister the Spirit and the level of the Spirit uh, can slip away. Let me, let me tell you how you can tell that happens. When your mind is thinking carnal thoughts, when your mind is thinking lustful thoughts, when you have a, a poor attitude. See, when you're full of the Holy Spirit, that simply means that the Holy Spirit is not just resident in your spirit, but your thoughts are Holy Spirit thoughts. Your emotions are feeling Holy Spirit emotions, okay? And you're filled with the Spirit. And so you're overflowing with the confidence in the Spirit, with the love of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, right? And so this says here, it says, uh, however, many of those who heard believed, and the number came to be about 5,000, and it came to pass that these rulers came together, and let's see, verse uh, 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. That meant right then he was full at that time. Now, uh, we don't know exactly what was happening just before this event. Was he in prayer? Was he praising God? We, it doesn't really give the detail. But what it does tell us is when this event happened, Peter was not on the down of being spirit-filled. No, he had been up he had been praying or praising God or something that allowed him to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. And this, this is important. We need to know. Uh, to stay full of the Spirit, you need to continually be filled. Receive the fullness of the Spirit. So then Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all. And let me just tell you, let me just uh, say it straight out. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified. Boy, I tell you, Peter's bold, isn't he? And this is what happens. You shall receive power, Acts 1.8 says. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. See, the power of the Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit gives us the boldness to talk to people, to say things that we wouldn't normally be confident enough to say or bold enough to say. And we're not talking about being harsh or rude or pointed, but we're talking about being bold to say the truth. And so he says, he says, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I, by the way, that's about the last time of Nazareth is used throughout the book of Acts because that was his, Nazareth speaks to his upbringing as a boy, but Jesus Christ or Messiah or anointed one speaks to the Holy Spirit being poured out on him. And that's the one that sticks throughout the rest of the New Testament. So let it be known to you that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. <laughs> He's giving all the glory the glory to Jesus. Verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Well, this is an Old Te Testament prophecy about the Messiah that he would be a stone that the builders rejected that ends up becoming the chief cornerstone or the, the stone that is laid first by, by which everything else has to line up to. And this is the chief cornerstone. So the one that was rejected ends up being the chief. Well, of course, Jesus was rejected. He ends up being the head of the church. But the builders that were prophesied about 
Well, Peter's identifying them as these religious Jewish leaders who are rejecting Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone, verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let me just say that again. Nor is there salvation in any other. Don't get the idea that somebody that was born in a remote part of the world from where you live, that because they were born into another religion, that therefore God understands that, you know, they think that's the right religion and, and he'll accept them and them being true to their religion and he'll accept them into heaven. No, it's not so. Satan has started a lot of false religions and deceptions. No, there's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. Some people will complain and say, well, why does it have to just be one way? Hey, we ought to thank God he made a way. We ought to thank God. Do you know what the price that it took for God to make one way? It cost him his son. It cost him his only son. We ought to, be, we ought to thank God he made a way for us instead of complaining that there can't be many ways. No, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Peter's really saying the same thing here in verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Well, of course, that's the name of Jesus. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, watch this, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. In other words, they could tell they didn't go to their theological schools. They didn't have the eloquence of the theological language and such. But they said, man, these guys are bold. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. See, up until this point, they, they thought, well, they've heard about Jesus and such, but didn't realize that these were men trained directly by Jesus. They, it, that just hit them. These are those disciples. And so, notice this, verse 14, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. They were having a hard time. Like, everybody knew who this guy was. Like, this is a miracle. So they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. The religious leaders were always trying to uh, think about what are the people going to say? Because they know they can make a ruling based on their authority, but would the people go along with it? So see, they had to think about the psychology of the people. And so uh, notice again, for indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. In other words, hey, it really happened. Verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now watch this. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Boy, I tell you, talk about bold. <laughs> They're bold. They're saying, we got to obey God rather than you. Verse 21, so when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of, because of the people. Notice again, because of the people. If they had not done this miracle and the people really didn't know who they were, they could have beaten up on them. But because they had done this miracle and all this crowd of people are amazed at this miracle and many have now believed in Jesus, these religious leaders are having a hard time figuring out if we beat them, everybody's going to know it because all eyes are on these guys. See, so these religious leaders are playing to the crowd. So it goes on to say, uh, because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Verse 22, for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. In other words, he'd been lame for over 40 years. 
Uh, verse 23, and being let go, this is important, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they had heard, the, so when they had heard that when the the believers, in other words, uh, that they went to that were in this house. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice. Now we're talking about a group of believers. It was probably a fairly large crowd inside of a home that were gathered together there. It says, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, and they're still praying, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So they're acknowledging in this prayer that it wasn't just the Jewish people and the Romans that killed Jesus, but this was intended by God. He was sending him to die for our sins. Verse 29, Still praying, now look, now Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Oh, I pray this over us today. I pray. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Watch this. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, had that been the temple, it likely would have said the temple, but it just said the place where they were assembled together was shaken. So we get the idea that this was a home or maybe a large room, maybe like the upper room where they were together. But the whole place was shaken with the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says, watch this, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> we know Peter and John for sure. And it seems like all these people had already been filled with the Spirit. So why would it say they were all filled with the Spirit? This is what I'm telling you. Refills. We need to stay Spirit-filled by prayer, by praising God, so that we remain filled with the Spirit. In fact, you remember in Ephesians 5.18, it says, uh, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another. Be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. See, and so these are the things you do to allow the fullness of the Spirit to continue to fill you up again and again. So it says here, when they had said these things, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. It doesn't say, and they spoke with other tongues like it did in Acts chapter 2 because these were already spiritual language or tongue talkers, if we could say it like that. But they spoke the word of God with boldness. Let me tell you, if you don't stay full of the Holy Spirit, you won't speak as you ought to speak. You don't, won't speak as often as you ought to speak. You won't speak as clearly and as boldly as you ought to speak. So we need to stay full of the Spirit so that we can minister the gospel, be witnesses unto the Lord. So, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart. Oh, this is precious. The multitude of those who believed, we're talking about Jewish believers in Jesus. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. You know this is the power of God. When people uh, are willing to say, oh, my possessions, hey, they're, they're for us, the body of Christ, not just me. Verse 33, excuse me. And with great power, watch this, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses. And this seems to be extra land, extra houses, not people selling the homes they lived in, but those who were possessors or landowners, uh, homeowners that have like rental properties and such. 
uh, possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Let me tell you, when people are willing to obey God with their money, that's when you know God has a grip on their heart. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. When you're willing to forfeit mammon to do what the Lord is telling you to do, that's when you know Jesus is really your Lord. Because otherwise, very likely, mammon can be controlling you and your decisions. Verse 36, And Joseph, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, now the apostles weren't just taking all this wealth for themselves, but they were distributing. It says in verse 35, they were distributing to people as they had need. So this was like a ministry and needs were being met. And a lot of people were impoverished here in the Jewish uh, sector in the Jewish society there in the Jerusalem area. And so you can see the power of God moving, but it's not just moving in miracles. It's not just moving in preaching. It's not just, he's, he's not just moving in prayer, but the Holy Spirit is also moving powerfully on the hearts of people to lay aside financial things and to allow their own possessions to be used by other people. That is a miracle. That's the heart of man. The selfishness of man being broken by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and so on. So praise God. See, the Holy Spirit has many effects on us as believers. And may the Lord do this in all of us. May we be so filled with the Spirit that we don't think normal, selfish, human thoughts, but that we'll think Holy Spirit thoughts. May it be so in Jesus' name. I'll see you tomorrow.